Okay, so let's start off with the first chapter in organic chemistry. This will mostly be a review of concepts from chemistry 101 and 102 or general chemistry. So let's talk a little bit about some of the background and some historical context for organic chemistry. So fundamentally, why is organic chemistry important? Well, organic chemistry is a, is a wonderful lens for studying and understanding biological systems. So fundamentally, living things are composed of organic molecules. And many organic compounds are the principal active components of medicines. Now, from a historical context in the mid 1800s, organic compounds in general were difficult to isolate, purify, and synthesize with the techniques and equipment available in the 1800s. However, just from a historical perspective, humans have been consuming, isolating, and interacting with organic compounds throughout our history. Now, the historical view in the mid 1800s was this idea that organic compounds contained a quote unquote vital force. And because they were from living sources, they could not be synthesized in the laboratory. Now, one of the really keystone experiments was that in 1816 by Chevrol, where he showed that you can prepare soap from animal fat and alkali with glycerol as a product. So this is a classic saponification reaction. And this was really revolutionary at the time because it showcased that you can system systemically synthesize products that were often associated with natural sources. In 1828, Wohler showed that it's possible to convert an inorganic salt of ammonium cyanide into the organic substance urea. So this really opened the door towards further investigations into methods to prepare, synthesize, isolate, and characterize organic compounds. And as such, a flurry of investigation went into methods and processes and reactions to convert one starting material into a desired organic product. Okay, so that's some historical basis. Let's talk a little bit about what organic chemistry actually focuses on. Organic chemistry fundamentally is the study of carbon containing compounds. 90% of 30 million known compounds contain carbon. And carbon as a group 4A element prefers to form four bonds. So we had to think about the realm of organic chemistry. It focuses heavily on carbon and other non-metal elements. Now let's talk a little bit about atomic structure. So what is the structure and composition of an atom? So just from our Chem 101 perspective, we know that matter is composed of atoms, where an atom is the smallest subunit of an element with the properties and reactivity of that element. Now, we can take an atom, such as that for example, of a carbon atom, and we can look at its component subatomic particle. And atoms are composed of smaller subatomic particles. And these three fundamental subatomic particles are known as protons, which in the case of a proton, it's a positively charged particle with a mass of one AMU. Now, what is the significance of protons? What do they indicate when we talk about atomic structure? Well, an element's identity depends on the number of protons, which is also called the atomic number. Each element has a unique symbol, a unique atomic number, and a unique number 
of protons. Okay, so the number of protons directly determines the identity of our element. Now we can figure out the atomic number Z from the atomic symbol and the periodic table. So for example, if we look at chlorine, which is a common element that we see in organic chemistry and organic reactions, the number above the element symbol is our atomic number. So we see that chlorine, uh, to answer the question in the chat, I'm using OneNote for uh, annotation of this document. So now that we're looking at the atomic symbol for chlorine, my question to everyone is, how many protons does chlorine have? How many protons does chlorine have? If we're reading off the atomic number, how many protons does chlorine have? 17, yep. So we have 17 protons, okay? Perfect. So from the periodic table and the atomic symbol, we can figure out the atomic number and the number of protons. Perfect. Now, the number of protons are interesting, but let's also now look at the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons and neutrons, which are a second fundamental subatomic particle that make up an atom, a neutron is a neutral particle with a mass of one AMU. Now, the mass number, which is a descriptor of the no is a descriptor of the number of protons and neutrons found in the nucleus of an atom. The place where this comes up most frequently is when talking about isotopes which are atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons. Okay. The really interesting, interesting thing about isotopes, as we'll see later on in this course, is that isotopes have very similar chemical properties. It's the same element after all, but isotopes have different masses. For example, Oxygen-18, which is commonly used as a isotope of oxygen for radio labeling purposes, um, has very similar properties and reactivity to oxygen-16, but these two isotopes have fundamentally have different masses. So it's the same element, but with a different mass. Now, we're saving the best for last. The last fundamental particle that is found in our atom is known as the electron. Now electrons are negatively charged particles that have a very, very, very small mass. They have a mass of 0 0.0001 AMU. And the fact that they're orders of magnitude smaller than our protons and neutrons leads to some very unique behavior for electrons. Now, in organic chemistry, we're very concerned with counting electrons and looking at the number of electrons associated with each atom in our molecule. Now, the main place where we start to see differences in the number of electrons associated with our atoms comes when we talk about ions, where we have the same element, but with a different charge, a different number of electrons. We can either have an anionic species, which is a negatively charged species. In this case, we have the anion of oxygen H18. And in the case of our anionic species, we have more electrons than protons. We can also have a cationic species. In the case of a cationic species, we have a positively charged 
ion. So for our cation, we have more protons than electrons. Now we can calculate the number of electrons if we know the charge and the number of protons. So solving for the number of electrons, we get the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons minus the charge. We can also write this as the atomic number minus the charge if that is more convenient. So let's show how this works. Let's show how this works. So for example, for sulfur two minus, okay, if we wanted to calculate the number of electrons Thinking about sulfur, how many protons does sulfur have? How many protons does sulfur have? If we look at the periodic table, if we go to the periodic table, how many protons does sulfur have? If we look in the periodic table for the atomic symbol for sulfur, So just as a reminder, this number in the upper left hand corner is our, is our mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons. If we look in the periodic table for sulfur, we see sulfur has an atomic number of 16. Now we have to continue on and we have to figure out the charge. What is the charge of sulfur 2 minus? What is the charge of sulfur two minus? What is the charge of sulfur? The charge is negative two. So if we take our number of protons minus the charge, we get our total number of electrons of 18 for sulfur two minus. Now, a very critical skill in efficiently drawing Lewis structures and efficiently drawing organic structures is the ability to count electrons. So that's why we did this entire exercise. So you're able to count electrons by counting up the, by looking at the atomic number and the charge for each atom. Perfect, wonderful. This, does this look like review to everyone? Does this look familiar to everyone? Has everyone seen this before, these calculations before? Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about isotope notation. We're gonna, we're gonna practice a little bit in identifying the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each of our atoms, okay? So starting off, just as a refresher, in isotope notation, the number in the bottom left-hand corner is our atomic number, which signifies the number of protons. The number in the upper left-hand corner is our mass number, which signifies the number of protons and neutrons. And finally, the number in the upper right-hand corner is our charge. Now, if we wanted to process this isotope symbol, the number of protons equals our atomic number. So in this case, our number of protons for oxygen would be eight. Our number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number. So we have a mass number of 18 and an atomic number of eight. That gives us 10 neutrons to work with. Finally, our number of electrons is equal to the atomic number minus the charge, which would be eight minus negative two, which gives us 10 electrons. Okay, so from an isotope symbol, we can calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Wonderful.
So let's do an example here where even if you aren't explicitly given the atomic number, if you have access to the periodic table, you can look up and find the atomic number of your element. So for example, in this case, if we look up and we find iron in the periodic table, we see a number 26 above iron symbol. So I'm gonna have everyone help me out here. How many protons does iron have to its name? How many protons does iron have? 26, okay. For our number of neutrons, we take the mass number minus the atomic number. And how many neutrons do we have? 30, exactly right. Now our number of electrons is equal to the atomic number minus the charge. So we have 26, our charge is positive three. So that gives us 23 electrons, perfect. Wonderful, so we can calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and most importantly, the number of electrons. Wonderful. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, models of atomic structure. How are these subatomic particles arranged in an atom? Well, the first and a relatively outdated model is known as the Rutherford model, which states that protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus and electrons surround the nucleus. A bit of an ambiguous phrase when you think about it. The Rutherford model also proposes that the majority of an atom is empty space. Okay. Now, there are many issues with the Rutherford model, and the Rutherford model was revised into what's known as the Schrodinger model. Now, thinking about the Schrodinger model and summarizing some of the main points of the Schrodinger model, first, electrons are very small subatomic particles. And because these electrons have such a small mass, these particles themselves exhibit a substantial amount of not only particle properties, but also wave-like properties. Now, when describing subatomic particles, we have to consider and think a little bit about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states the exact position and energy of a subatomic particle cannot be simultaneously measured. There's, a, there's an inherent uncertainty in the position and energy of an electron if we try to determine both or if we attempt to determine both to a high level of precision. So in the Schrodinger model we take the following approach. First electrons are described as standing waves. So we, we, we see this if to get an idea of a standing wave if you ever have a string and if you pluck a string in a like guitar, for example, you end up with a wave that is, you end up with what's known as a standing wave. Okay? So just like when you pluck a guitar string and you observe a standing wave on the string, you can think superficially as if you're when surrounding an atom, your electron can be viewed as a standing wave. Constrained in the area around your nucleus. That's not super important here. Our goal and what we're trying to get out of this in organic chemistry is to look at solutions for our electron and look at how electrons are modeled in the Schrodinger model. So our goal in this case is to solve for the energy of an electron, okay? So when you solve the Schrodinger equation, you get a series of what are known as wave functions. Now the wave function itself doesn't have any meaning, 
But if we can modify this wave function, we can begin to look at descriptions of an electron in detail. So the wave function depends on a few quantum numbers, n, l, ml, and ms. And we can solve for the energy of an electron for a specific set of quantum numbers, okay? Each unique electron in our atom has a unique set of quantum numbers describing that electron. So for example, we can look at an electron with, a val with an n value of n equals two, L equals one, ML is equal to negative one, and MS is equal to plus one half. So each of these quantum numbers are describing this specific electron in our atom. Okay, now what does this have to do with organic chemistry? Why am I talking about the Schrodinger equation? Well, the wave function squared represents what's known as an orbital, which is the position probability distribution map of an electron of a given energy. That's a very fancy way of saying an orbital describes the region of space an electron with a given energy is likely to be found. So in effect, we've looked at the, so in the Schrodinger model, we have conceded we can't determine the position and energy of an electron, okay? So we've said, okay, we want to know for an electron of a specific energy, what is the general region of space that that electron is likely to be present? Okay, so if we look at the wave function squared, we get a series of space filling models that we call orbitals. So these shapes, these orbitals, describe the region of space that an electron of a specific energy is likely to be found. Now, orbitals themselves very closely correlate with the electron density associated with our atom. So as orbitals describe the region of, regions of space that an electron is likely to be present, these orbital pictures very closely correlate with the observed electron density depictions. Okay, so how can we, how can we use this? How can we use this? Well, first let's talk a little bit about how these orbitals vary with quantum numbers. So let's talk about how these quantum numbers affect orbitals size, shape, and energy. Okay, so first, depending on the orbital, an electron is more likely to be in certain regions of space. So these orbitals can help inform the, the relative distribution of our electron density in our atoms and in our broader molecular structure. Now, the first principal quantum number that we need to discuss is n, which is the principal quantum number. n dictates orbital size and energy. n controls the distance of an electron from the nucleus and the energy of an electron. So the larger the n, the larger and higher in energy your orbital. And we can see this quite clearly if we look at a 1s orbital, which is n equals 1, and a 2s orbital, which is n equals 2. Which orbital is larger? Which, which orbital is extending farther from the nucleus? The n equals 1 or the n equals 2? n equals two, right? This is a larger orbital. And as a result, is the electron higher or lower in energy? We have a larger orbital. We're farther from the nucleus. Is our electron higher or lower in energy? Yep, 
it's higher in energy. Now, this is really important because already we're starting to see a link between these orbital quantum numbers, these electron quantum numbers and electron properties and reactivity. The higher the energy your electron is, the more readily that electron is able to potentially participate in electron transfer and other bonding events. Okay. Now, Here's the link. Here's how we tie these orbitals back to our periodic table. Electrons in atoms can be thought of as found as being found in principal energy levels, which are called N, which are called also shells. A shell is a row in the periodic table. The N number is our row number. So the first row in the periodic table, I like to call the n equals one row. The second row is the n equals two row. Okay, so depending on where an element is located in the periodic table, the outermost orbital will have a different size. Further, we also see is that all orbitals with the same principal quantum number are found in the same shell. So that these 2s and 2p orbitals are found in the n equals 2 shell. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, n controls orbital size and energy. It controls how far the electron is from the nucleus and the relative energy of that electron. Okay, we're starting to get somewhere here. Now, each principal energy level or shell is divided into subshells with different orbital shapes. Now, orbital shape depends on L, which is known as the angular momentum quantum number. Now, the angular momentum quantum number controls orbital shape and, it, and allowed values of L range from zero to N minus one. So here an ex, here's an example of four different orbital shapes and these four different commonly observed subshells in the periodic table. Now a subshell is best thought of as a section of a row in the periodic table. So if we're looking at the periodic table, the first two elements are known as the quote unquote S subshell, the middle transition metals are known as the D subshell, and the rightmost non-metals are known as the P subshell element. And we'll talk, what, we'll talk more about each of these letters in a moment. Okay, so we have our shells, which are rows in the periodic table, and each of our shells can be divided into subshells. So let's talk more about these subshells and the different orbital shapes associated with each angular momentum quantum number. So first things first, let's look at the S orbital. So the S orbital is described by an angular momentum quantum number or an L value of zero. Uh, yes, I can post the annotated notes on Canvas. So these S orbitals, as we can see from this picture, are spherical shaped. And we can determine the number of unique orbitals in a subshell by looking at the ML value. ML ranges from negative L to zero to positive L, 
and ML describes the number of unique orbital orientations. In this case, we have only one value of ML, and as a result, we have one orbital orientation. Intuitively, this makes sense. There's not really, there aren't really many ways for you to orient a sphere in a unique arrangement. Okay, so for S orbitals, the one thing I want you to remember, we have one unique orbital orientation. Now, when we start to look at larger N values, we begin to see what are known as nodes. Now a node is really important in terms of bonding behavior. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about what do, is a node. A node is a region of space that has zero electron density. So does everyone see this region where it's left as a blank white space? This region is known as a node. Now, a node has a large amount of significance as it's a region where an electron is, is not found. There's zero electron density in that region of space. And we can actually figure out the number of nodes by taking n minus l minus one. So for example, for a 2s orbital, our number of nodes would be equal to two this is our n minus zero for our l minus one. And that gives us one node in our 2s orbital. Do the s orbitals make sense to everyone? Does everyone understand the shape and number of unique s orbitals? Does this make sense to everyone so far? Okay. Perfect, perfect. So let's look now at the p orbitals. p orbitals are described by L equals one. As we notice, the p orbitals are dumbbell or peanut shaped. Now, because we have a value of L equals one, we can have ML values from positive L to zero to negative L. And as we see, we have one, two, three, unique ML values. So we have three unique orbitals with three different orientations. Now, this is really important. Does everyone notice how the three P orbitals have a different orientation in space? Does everyone notice how they're pointing in different directions in space? Now this is really critical because when we start to talk about how we mix orbitals for bonding, this three-dimensional orientation plays a huge role in determining bonding patterns. Additionally, as we notice, there is a region with no electron density in each of our p orbitals, and we call these regions nodes. So we have one node in our p orbital. Yes, exactly right. They're at different points on the x, y, and z axis. And if you wanted to be fully formal, we call one of these orbitals a px, the other a py, and the third a pz orbital. I prefer not to distinguish them by x, y, and z because the orbitals are identical in energy and you actually can't distinguish these orbitals apart if you just look at their energy. Now, one last feature that I want to bring to your attention is that if, if we were to draw a p orbital as accurately as possible, I would draw a p orbital in the following way. I'd draw my, my two lobes and then I'd shade in one region. Now, this is a common depiction in most organic texts, and this is describing in, this is describing a positively phased region of our orbital and a negatively phased region of our orbital. Phase is not charge. 
phase is not charge. Phase is describing how is describing the phase of the wave associated with this electron's wave function. And this phasing impacts bonding because depending on how these differently phased regions overlap, we either get constructive bonding or destructive antibonding. So we'll, we'll return to this idea of orbital phasing later on in this chapter. But what I want you to do whenever you see a p orbital, I want you to get in the habit of shading one of the lobes to represent that these two lobes have a different phase. And we'll talk about how phasing impacts bonding later on in this chapter. Does this depiction of a p orbital look familiar to everyone? Um, did you see this depiction in 101 or 102? Perfect, perfect. Okay, so we've touched on the, the p orbitals. Let's talk about the d orbitals um, as they do come up pretty heavily when we look at expanded octets and some of the unique properties and reactivity of large non-metal elements. So the d orbitals, it's L equals two. These are clover shaped orbitals. And we have five different spatial orientations leading to five unique d orbitals. Each of these orbitals, so if we calculate our nodes, let's calculate our number of nodes, for example, for a 3d orbital. So our number of nodes are equal to n minus l minus 1. So we have 3 minus 2. minus one, so for a 3D orbital, we'd have zero nodes. For a 4D orbital, we have N minus L minus one, which gives us four minus two minus one, which would give us one node. Okay, so to, to touch on this idea of orbital phasing once again, when we're generating these orbital pictures, we model our electrons as standing waves. Now waves are phased. They contain regions of positive and negative amplitude separated by a node, right? Now, just like this wave, just like this wave is phased, the wave function for an electron, the orbital that describes the probability of finding an electron in that region of space is phased. Orbitals have phase and then contain regions of positive and negative amplitude. This phasing affects how orbitals overlap in bonding and how atoms can utilize their orbitals to overlap and form chemical bonds. It constrains how we can overlap our orbitals to form a productive bond. Okay. Now, we're next going to talk a little bit about electron configuration. So we're going to take these orbitals and and this is a bit of a heuristic, this is a bit of a shortcut in logic. We're going to Think about this as if we're filling our orbitals and populating our orbitals with electrons. Now the Pauli exclusion principle states that no two electrons in the same atom can have identical values for all four quantum numbers. So each unique electron has a unique set of quantum numbers. So that includes N, L, ML, now, the reason why I group N, L, and ML together is I like to think that these quantum numbers really focus on describing the orbital. 
So N describes the size, L describes the shape of the orbital, and ML describes the orientation. The last quantum number is very much focused on the electron, and that is ms, or the spin quantum number. The spin quantum number specifies electron spin, and ms can be either plus one half or minus one half. Now, what is electron spin? Electron spin is the, di is the direction of an electron's magnetic moment. So electrons themselves generate a small magnetic field. And the way that you rationalize this is you can visualize, this is not what's actually happening, but this is how we visualize and rationalize it. We can think of it as if the electron is a charge that is spinning in place. And that's what's generating this magnetic field. Now, depending on the, whether the magnetic field is up spin or down spin for an electron, that determines how that determines, so the spin of an electron determines whether two electrons can occupy the same orbital. And opposite spins, opposite electron spins, can pair in an orbital. We can have two electrons in an orbital if we have opposite spins. So notice in this little orbital box depiction, we have two electrons of opposite spin. Now, the spin quantum number is describing a specific electron in an orbital. Now, as we notice, we can have two spin values for an electron, plus one half or minus one half. Thus, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons of opposite spins. Two electrons per orbital. Okay, let's keep going. Now, if we think about filling our orbitals with electrons, if we think about writing an orbital diagram for a given atom, electrons will occupy the lowest energy orbitals first, then and only then are your higher energy orbitals filled. That begs the question, how are our different orbitals sorted by energy? Well, a general filling order is shown here where in general energy increases as our n increases and as l increases. So as we increase n and l, our orbital energy increases. This filling order should be very familiar to everyone from 101 and 102. Does this orbital filling order look familiar? Perfect, perfect. So how do we use this? How do we actually use this? Well, what we can do now is we can think a little bit about and figure out how many electrons we can fit in a subshell. So this is a unique L value. Remember, when we talk about subshells, we're talking about L. So to figure out how many electrons that we can fit in a subshell, we take the total number of orbitals that we have, and we know that we can fit two electrons per orbital. So for our S subshell, we have one unique orbital, so we can fit two electrons. For our P subshell, we have three orbitals, so we can hold six electrons. For our D subshell, we have five orbitals, so we can hold 10 electrons. Now, one thing that's really important to keep in mind, orbitals with the same n and l value are known as degenerate orbitals. They have the same energy and are filled with equal preference. Okay, wonderful. 
So let's put this together and let's talk about electron configuration. So first and foremost, we count our electrons, where our number of electrons are equal to the atomic number minus the charge. Now, we place electrons in orbitals from the lowest to highest energy orbital until all of our electrons have been placed. So for example, looking at beryllium, let's write out each of our available orbitals. So I'm gonna write out 1s, 2, 1s, 2s, okay? Now let's go to our periodic table and let's figure out the number of electrons associated with beryllium. How many electrons does beryllium have to its name? How many electrons does beryllium have to its name if we look it up in the periodic table? And don't be shy to unmute and state your response verbally or to, at, or to type in the chat. Four, exactly right. We have four electrons to work with. Okay, so what orbital do we fill first? 1s, okay. Now we've used up two electrons. Where do our last two electrons go? Where are they forced to go? The 2s, yep. Now, once we have this orbital diagram filled in, we can note the number of electrons in a given orbital n and l value to write electron configuration. Now electron configurations list the subshells that contain electrons and they indicate the number of electrons in that subshell with a superscript. So looking at our 1s orbital, how many electrons does our 1s orbital have in beryllium? Two, perfect. What about our 2s orbital? How many electrons does our 2s orbital have? Two. So this is a complete electron configuration for beryllium. Now, personally, I like the orbital box diagrams more, and we'll be using these box diagrams way more in organic. It's probably one of the most important, one of the more important skills that you get from 101 and 102. Okay, so here's just a summary of how to write an electron configuration. Everyone seems pretty comfortable with that, which is good to see. Okay, now I'm gonna teach you a trick. If you haven't seen this picture, this, this picture is really, really helpful for writing configurations. So I like to think, and the best way to view the periodic table is that it's divided into regions of two, six, 10, and 14 columns corresponding to the maximum number of electrons in the S, P, D, and F sublevels. Now, each row represents an energy level, a unique N value. And the period number, which is the row number, indicates the N value for your outermost orbital. Now, certainly, you can just fill from lowest to highest energy using this orbital filling order. Or you can say, well, if each box in the periodic table represents room for an electron, each step to the right on the periodic table adds an electron to the lowest energy orbital following our pairing rules. So let's look at aluminum. Let's look at aluminum. So first and foremost, I need everyone to tell me how many electrons does aluminum have to its name? How many electrons does aluminum have to its name? 13, okay. So we're gonna start, we have our 1s, our 2s, our 2p, our 3s, and finally our 3p orbital. Okay, so we place two electrons on our 1s, two electrons in our 2s, 
six electrons in our 2p. We have three electrons left. Where do we place our first set of electrons? Where do we place our electrons next? 3s, yep. And finally, where does our last electron go? 3p, and does it matter which one I pick? Does it matter? Is there any preference? Can I put my electron in any of these 3p orbitals or is there a specific one that I need to choose? Do I have to put it in the first box? Exactly right, I can put it in any of these boxes. I'll put it in the first one just for aesthetic reasons, but it can technically, technically go in any of these 3p orbitals. Because, remember, these 3p orbitals are degenerate. They have the same energy. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this look familiar? So if we're writing out our configuration, this would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Perfect. Let's now talk about a really important rule when filling in orbital diagrams, and this is Hund's rule which states that electrons are placed in empty degenerate orbitals before pairing electrons. Now, why is that? Well, pairing electrons in the same orbital costs energy. If we think we, we're drawing these, these electrons as arrows, it's better to think of electrons as what they are, negatively charged particles. And as we know, like charges repel. So these electrons repel other electrons. This repulsive interaction is not very stabilizing. It's destabilizing. So we'd ideally want to keep our electrons in separate degenerate orbitals if possible. So let's look at nitrogen and let's apply Hund's rule to nitrogen. So first things first, for nitrogen, how many electrons does nitrogen have to its name? Seven, okay. So we'll write out our 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals. We'll then place our electrons. We place four electrons in our 1s and 2s. I have three electrons remaining. Well, I have to start somewhere, so I'm gonna place an electron in my 2p orbital. Where do I place my second electron? In the same 2p orbital or in a different 2p orbital? Or in the next one. Next one, okay. Perfect. Now for my last electron, do I place it in the filled 2p, in a partially filled 2p orbital, in an empty 2p orbital, or in the 3s orbital. Where do I place it? Empty 2p? Yep, exactly right. There we go. So in general, we place our electrons in empty degenerate orbitals, empty orbitals of the same energy first. So we'd write this configuration as 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Okay. So let's do some practice now. I'm gonna let everyone work on the following example. I'd like you to look at carbon. I'd like you to write an electron configuration for carbon, fill in an orbital diagram, and I'd like you either using the annotate tool to draw out and an complete orbital diagram, Or if you want to communicate your response in the chat, you can type to me in the chat the number of unpaired electrons. So let's take about two to three minutes and let's fill in the orbital box diagram for carbon.
It's wonderful. I see students already using the annotate feature and the annotated solution that I see drawn looks perfect. Yep, looks perfect. So allow me to clear this annotated solution. That's wonderful. And I'm glad that everyone knows how to use the annotate tool. It's the little pen in the Zoom overlay. So looking at carbon, we see our number of electrons. So counting the number of electrons for carbon, we have six electrons. We fill in our 1s and 2s orbital, and then we place our two electrons in separate 2p orbitals. Wonderful. So we're currently at the end of our scheduled lecture period. We actually went about five minutes over as we have an hour and a half lecture period. So this is a good stopping point. We've developed the skill of drawing orbital diagrams. And what we're gonna do next session is we're gonna apply these orbital diagrams and start to describe higher order bonding. And we're gonna start to mix orbitals to make hybrid orbitals. And these box diagrams are critical to this process. So I'm going to stop the recording for today.